We have your Bibles. If you open the book of Daniel, if you would, please. The book of Daniel, chapter number 2. We began last week to look at overcoming impossible, impossible circumstances. Not just hard. And Daniel, I would say Daniel chapter 1, would be overcoming a hard circumstance. That's Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel shows up into the, the kingdom of Babylon as a young man. He's called a child. We don't know exactly how old that is. Some will say he's, he's 7 or 8, some up to 15. He's under 20. We know that. He's a young man. He has faith with some hard, in chapter 1, some hard circumstances. He tried to violate his conscience and displease his God. Eat this and drink this. And Daniel stood in the face of that by his faith in God. Daniel chose to believe God, right? That's our theme this year, believe God. So Daniel chose to believe God, and he overcame hard circumstances. So much so that the end of the chapter 1 tells us that he was 10 times healthier and smarter than everyone else in that group. Even his three friends, 10 times. I asked that question that morning, how do you quantify that 10 times smarter? We can tell if someone's smarter than us, but 10 times smarter? Or was he 10 times faster, knew 10 times more answers? Whatever it is, the Bible tells us he was 10 times smarter and healthier than everybody else. And because of that, God allowed him to be raised up in the kingdom as a wise man. Even as a young man, he was a wise man. Why? Because he believed God. Wisdom that comes from above is first pure, uh, pure and peaceful and gentle, easy to be entreated. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. True wisdom comes from above, and it is always, it is always better than earthly wisdom. Ten times better for following Scripture. We come to chapter 2. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar dreams a dream. He dreams a dream, and we looked at this some last week. He dreams a dream, and remember that dreams nowadays don't mean what, what dreams in Bible times meant. Dreams in Bible time, uh, sometimes God would speak through them. Because God has finished his word and given us his word, he does not speak the same in dreams. So if you have a crazy dream one night, all right, it's not God coming to talk to you. Follow your Bible. You'll, you're going to read about these things. Well, I was asleep and God came to me. Or I was asleep and I went to God. I show you later on some scripture that disproves that. There are people that say, well, I, I died and I came back. Mark that. That's not according to what the Bible says. All right, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. But back then in Bible times, the word of God was not complete yet, was not finished yet. And so God could. Now, could God reveal himself in dreams? He can do whatever he wants to do. But he's chosen now to reveal himself through his word, which we can look at every single morning, not just when we're asleep. All right? You can put the Bible under your pillow, but it won't soak into your mind. You can look at it every morning, afternoon, and night. You can go back to it and find security and comfort and help in a time of need. God's word is strong, but Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He was bothered by this dream, the Bible tells us. So much so, he was agitated that he couldn't sleep. Sleep left him. He was so bothered that sleep left him. He called all the wise men together, and he said, Listen, tell me the meaning of this dream. They said, Sure, you tell us a dream, we'll tell you the meaning. Remember this, right? He said, uh, There's a slight problem, boys. I forgot my dream. <laughs> I said, Okay, well, well, great. I said, uh, uh, You can tell us the dream, we'll tell you the meaning. He says, No, listen, if you don't tell me what my dream is and what the meaning is, I'm going to kill you all. Talk about zero to a hundred like that. He said, either tell me what it is and what it means. He said, they said, no, king. Uh, once again, if you, if you tell us your dream, we'll tell you the interpretation. <laughs> now, this is a very rare, the Bible says, they said, it's a very rare thing you ask of us. We can't do this. No one on earth, and they're exactly right, no one on earth could do that. He says, oh, gentlemen, you don't understand. What I'm telling you is that if you don't tell me, what my dream is, and what the meaning is, then I'm going to kill you. They said, well, king, uh, we can't do this. You tell us the dream, we'll tell you the meaning. He said, no, that's it. You're just trying to buy time. In fact, kill all of the wise men. Boom, order goes out. Order goes out, and the captain of the guard comes to Daniel in chapter Daniel chapter number 2. And he comes in verse number 14. Ariok is the captain's name. See, he was agitated and he made an astounding request. 
And the captain of the guard, Ariok, comes to Daniel, and, and Daniel says, why is this king's commandment so much in haste? Like, what is going on here? Apparently, Daniel was not in that first meeting. He somehow missed that summons. He's like, okay, well, before you stab me through the heart and chop off my head and destroy me like the king's commanding, what's going on, Ariok? And Ariok explains what happened. Daniel makes an appeal. He makes an appeal and he, he goes to the captain of the guard, can I go talk to the king? And he goes to the king and says, king, w- would, you, would you let me have a little bit of time? Verse 16 he said, he went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Verse 17, then Daniel, in chapter 2, went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his co- companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Understand why Daniel and his friends were praying. They were praying to stay alive. It was a selfish prayer. Lord, can we not die today? Lord, can we live one more day, please? We don't want to die. That's what the Bible says. Lord, grant us mercy that we don't die with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Sometimes we're tempted not to pray for what we deem to be selfish prayers. I think you ought to pray according to God's will. But Daniel and his friends had no problem saying, Lord, we don't want to die. Lord, please help us. Can we have two more weeks, please, Lord? Help us. And understand something. There's an urgency of that prayer right there. There's a, because this was an impossible circumstance. This was not just hard. There's no way out. They couldn't go get some overtime and pay off the king. All right, they couldn't go to a dream tell and find out the dream. There was no way that they could make this thing happen. They had to rely upon their faith. And sometimes in your life and in my life, God will give us hard circumstances that we'll be tempted to rely on our own strength to solve rather than God's strength. That's chapter 1. But sometimes, chapter 2, God will give us an impossible circumstance where there is no option but to look up. This morning, I want to look at this particular next section and we look at this impossible circumstance. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, help us as we look to you. Give us your wisdom and your mind. Lord, I been so impressed and challenged by Daniel. And we learned something this morning. Would you touch us in Jesus' name? Amen. I want you to look at a verse in Daniel chapter 2. Verse 28, it's kind of the passage that we're taking off of this particular, or the verse we're kind of jumping off in chapter 2. In verse 28, Daniel says this, but there is a God in heaven. Can you say that with me? But there is a God in heaven. But there, help me again, is a God in heaven. You see, the other wise men had said, there's a lot of gods on the earth. The Babylonians worshipped gods. The Egyptians worshipped other gods. Every nation worshipped gods. But Daniel said, but there is a God capital G in your Bible, because he is the sovereign God, the creator of the universe, king of kings, and lord of lords. And this is who Daniel appealed to. He appealed to the king, and then he appealed to God. And he prayed. This morning, I want to look at something starting in verse number 19. I want to see the answer from God. The answer from God. The boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah all prayed. And God answered them in verse number 19. The Bible says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. The answer from God. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelt in him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. I want to look at this morning. The next point here is the answer from God. They got home, and at some point, they begin to pray fervently. They begin to pray urgently. And at some point in the night, God came and answered their prayer. Now remember, they were praying 
for the dream in order to stay alive. And at some point, God answered that prayer. Can you imagine the relief that came in when that prayer is answered? I get to live to see another day. Not because of me, not because of my goodness, not because of my worth or anything, but because there is a God. There was an answer from God. It came in the night. I wonder this, though. How long had they prayed and sought God's face? How long had they prayed? Sometimes we are quick to pray and quick to quit praying. Lord, help me, and then it's out of our minds. It's out of our minds. We pray one time, and, and oh, didn't see an answer yet. Okay, I'm out of here. Guess God's going to let me deal with this one all by myself. Because this was an impossible circumstance, there was an urgency, a fervency to their prayers, and they prayed, and they prayed, and at some point in night vision, God said, I hear your prayer, and I'm going to answer that prayer. You see, prayer beseeches and beholds the face of God. Yet, we don't often turn to prayer. In November of 2015, there were terror attacks in Paris. These terror attacks left at least 129 people dead and hundreds more injured. And social media was, was set afire with the hashtag, hashtag, pray for Paris. You ever notice in this world, though they want to deny God and remove him from the public scene, take down his commandments and cut out his word and remove prayer, when something bad happens that people want us to pray? You ever notice that? Prayer vigils, and they'll put up pictures and people go by and pray. And everyone wants prayer. And, and during this time, it was no different, apparently, in, in Paris in 2015. And the hashtag, pray for Paris, that they said just blew up over, over social media. Until one person, a cartoonist for a French publication, said, Thank you for pray for Paris, but we don't need more religion. Our faith should go to music, life, and joy. She's saying, don't pray for Paris. We hear that and we're kind of shocked a little bit about it. Something inside of us kind of twists, right? Someone asked me not to pray. Hey, you mean, you would be shocked if, if, uh, if, if you heard I was going through a surgery. And you said, well, Brother Howell, when's your surgery? I'd love to pray for you. Hey, don't pray for me. Don't worry about it. You would say, well, 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 well. <laughs> You know, I, I would like to pray for you. No, don't pray for me. I don't want you to pray for me. You, you'd probably say, well, well Pastor, have I, have I done something to offend you? Do you think my prayer life stinks? No, I just don't want you to pray for me. You would be bothered by that. It would bother us, would it not? Or if you came to me and said, you know, Pastor, I'm going through this hard time at work and it's a tough situation with my coworkers and, boy, I'm taking a lot, of, a lot of heat and, boy, there's some persecution there. Would you pray for me? No, I'm not going to pray for you. <laughs> but pastor, you're my pastor. Can you pray for me? No, I don't have time to pray for you. You would be like, wow, what's going on here? Because we claim in those situations to value prayer. We put a high value on prayer. When something bad happens, we're faced with an impossible circumstance, we claim to run to prayer. We want to list everyone else's prayer in our, in, in, for our support. If our missionaries come through, I feel your prayers but I have a question. Do you really value prayer? Not in word, but in deed. I mean, are you willing to apply yourself? I mean, these men, Daniel, Hananiah, Asher, Azariah, and Mishael, they applied themselves because it was impossible. It was life and death. At some point, God answered their prayer. He answered their prayer in an amazing way. He came in the same way that he came to Nebuchadnezzar. He came back to Daniel. And he gave him the answer. Harry Ironside, he was a famous teacher and pastor of Moody Memorial Church. He was raised by a godly mother who was committed to teaching and modeling faith and trust in Christ. She was left to raise her sons after the sudden death of her husband. When Harry was two, according to the example, she had the opportunity to practice what she'd preached. One night, or I'm sorry, one morning, the cupboards were utterly bare. She gathered her children to the breakfast table and offered a prayer of grace over their empty plates. Apparently she said this, Father, thou hast promised in thy word your bread shall be given you and your water shall be sure. We have the water 
and we thank Thee for it, and now we trust Thee for the bread or for that which will take its place. Now, you know how the story's going to end, right? Right? They starved that day. Is that how, do you think that's how the story ends? What do you think happens? Come on, somebody, what do you think happens? Right then, there was a knock on the door. Now, you're not surprised by that, are you? Well, you're not surprised for a couple of reasons. One, because as a pastor, if I'm giving the illustration, you figure there's a happy ending. <laughs> number one, you've learned to expect happy endings to stories that I try to share. But number two, you've heard about this before. Someone's praying for food. Knock, knock, knock. Sure enough, a man was there who owed her some money for some seamstress work. And he said, and he apparently owed her money for a long time and said, Ma'am, I don't have any money right now. Will you take some potatoes as partial payment? God answers prayers. He wants to answer your prayer, and he wants to answer my prayer. There's an urgency, an importunity, asking God, and a surrender to his answers. Not my will, but thine be done, the words of Jesus. Sometimes when we pray, we say, well, Lord, whatever your will is, it'll be okay. And it truly is. But it's kind of a Christian cop-out. Right? Just so in case I don't get let down, whatever happens, happens. Now, whatever happens is in God's hands. I understand that. What I'm saying is it's okay to pray and ask God for specific things and pray for God to work. We'll see it later on when we study the story of uh, the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. They say our God can deliver us, but if not. All right, but it's not a... Uh, result. It's not just uh, saying, okay, whatever happens, happens. All right, Lord. But it's like, Lord, we need you to work. Lord, we don't want to die. Can you imagine those prayers? Lord, we don't want to die. Not tonight. Lord, not tomorrow. Help us not to die. Lord, give us this answer to this prayer. Lord, I don't want to die. And God answered it. You see, prayer isn't the crazy option. It's the right option. Crazy, prayer isn't the crazy option. Prayer is the right option. In 1964, a freighter carrying 6,000 sheep capsized and sank in Kuwait's harbor. With so many dead animals underwater, Kuwaitis worried that the rotting carcasses would pollute the water, and a way had to be found to lift the ship and remove the sheep before the harbor was contaminated. So finally, a Danish engineer by the name of Carl Croyer remembered a comic book in which Donald Duck and his nephews raised a sunken ship by stuffing it full of ping-pong balls. He thought the idea was worth a try, so Croyer had 27 million ping-pong balls injected into the hole, and it worked, thanks in part to Donald Duck. <laughs> that, my friends, is the crazy option. Prayer is not the crazy option. Prayer is the right option. In an impossible circumstance, prayer is the only option. All oh, Daniel prayed and God answered. I can imagine the joy. You think Daniel woke up his friends at that moment? You think he stopped them at that moment? You better believe he did. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but there's no doubt in my mind, as you would, as I would. Boys, we're not dying tonight. Listen, don't worry about praying. We'll get some coffee. We're going to see the king. It's going to be okay. God has answered our prayers. I've challenged you about this before. I would remind you of this. I hope there's some things that only you pray for. That only you pray for. So you know that God answers your prayers. I'm glad that God answers your prayers, but I want to know that my God hears me when I pray. And there's some things that I pray for. I don't tell anybody else, not my wife, my family, not the, not the staff men here, so that when God answers it, I know that my God, who I profess and claim and live to have belief in Him, hears me. I hope that you have some things that you pray for. When God answers your prayer request, it'll strengthen your heart. I told this story once, I'll tell it again, though, about my son, Johnny. I've been talking about this last year. When it was last April, right before the transition, he came to me and something happened. He was trying to save up for something. Didn't have enough money for it, and something happened. He was a little bit disappointed. It was a Wednesday night. He was disappointed sitting outside my office in the school in the outer office. He's crying a little bit. I said, what's wrong, buddy? He said, I was really, really wanting this, and I, don't, I didn't get it. 
I said, let's pray about it. I said, but Johnny, only you're going to pray for this. I said, I'm not going to. We're not going to let mommy pray for it. You're going to pray. And he was praying for $50. Now, as a dad, I could have solved that problem. Or I don't have all the money in the world, but I could have solved for my son $50. And, and I was almost tempted to when you see his heart hurting, right? And as a dad, it, it hurts my heart to see my son's heart hurting. But I said, you're going to pray, Johnny, for $50. And he, a little bit of fear and trepidation, said, okay, Daddy. I said, Johnny, I want, I want you to know that God hears you. He walked out that night, and I began to pray, Lord, would you build my faith, son? i I got to be honest, I was a little bit worried. It's faith, right? Lord, I know you can do this, but would you let him see that? I don't, I, please don't let my son down. It was a night of transition, Transition Sunday, when, when Pastor Lett called up my kids on the stage a month later, May 19th. He handed all three of my kids a $50, I think it was a $50 bill. After the service, we were, of course, talking to all you folks and so many kind things, hugging and shaking hands, Johnny runs up to me. The first thing Johnny said was, he did it. God answered my prayer. But that builds faith more than any other thing that I can say to him when he knows that his God answers prayer. And Daniel saw that, and I hope you in your life can see it as well. If you haven't seen it yet, you say, well, pastor, I've never seen it. Well, have you prayed for something like that? Have you been fervent? Have you been urgent? I'm not talking about just in passing. I'm like, you get alone with God and say, God, you've got to answer this. God, I need to see you. And God answered it. It's not the crazy option, it's the right option. And then I see the application of the dream given to the king. Boy, Daniel, I think, rushed back. He went to the, to the, to the captain and he rushed back to stand before the king. That's where he gives us that phrase. Uh, he says in verse 27, he says, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, and the magicians, and soothsayers show unto the king? Daniel sets up the application with this question. Hey, king, how are your smart guys doing? King, those guys that you've depended upon, how are they doing? How's that working out for you, King Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, they can't get this question? If I can rephrase the question for you and I today, hey, how are all the smart guys that you depend on in life doing? Listen to Dr. Phil. How about you listen to the doctor who made all life? All right? The self-proclaimed experts of life. Why don't you look at the expert of the universe? How are those experts working out for you? There is a God in heaven. He can do the impossible. He can reveal the secret. He is alone in his power, and he's omniscient of the future. That's what Daniel says. In verse number 30, I love the perspective that Daniel brings. He says, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. <laughs> Daniel says, it's not about me, king. It's not about me. I didn't get this because I'm super smart. I didn't get this because I'm, I'm special, because I, I lined up the stones just right or read the stars just right. King, it's not about me, but for their sakes. that shall make known the interpretation and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. What Daniel's saying is it has nothing to do with me, but everything to do with God. And that's a good perspective on life. Nothing to do with me, everything to do with him. Hey, why don't you remember that when you go to work tomorrow? Nothing to do with me, everything to do with him. How would you remember that when you get a flat tire? It has nothing to do with me, it has everything to do with, with him. How about you remember that when you get a promotion or a raise, you get a bonus or your tax return, and you're like, well, praise the Lord. Nothing to do with me, everything to do with, with him. Daniel had the right perspective. Nothing to do with me, but everything to do with him. He goes on to, to share the interpretation of the dream. It did strike me as, as odd. I, I've read this interpretation. Daniel uh, will line up with, with the future, the book of prophecy, the book of Daniel is. Often in, in Bible colleges, Daniel and Revelation are taught together. Daniel and Revelation just mesh like this in, in prophecy of the future. And I was first kind of curious as I studied this passage, why did God choose a pagan king like Nebuchadnezzar to reveal a master plan to? Of all the people in the world that God could reveal this to, why did God choose Nebuchadnezzar? I have an answer. It's a good answer. You know why? Because it's not about Nebuchadnezzar, it's about him. <laughs> it's not about this guy, it's about him. 
I don't know the mind of the Lord. Uh, our ways are not His ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts for sure. It has everything, everything to do with God. Then I notice one more thing at the end of the chapter. This is a great, a great account, right? Boy, strengthens our faith. Maybe somebody this morning walk away. I need to pray. I need to be fervent in prayer. God will hear me. And that's challenging. But then I looked at verse 48 and 49. We're with the end of the story, if I can. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole providence of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. <laughs> Last thing I see is this, the acclamation of Daniel. At the end of the story, and this is the way that God works every time. Daniel was just trying to save his own life and please his God. God answered the prayer. He shared the interpretation. And all of a sudden, Daniel gets a lot of blessings. He gets uplifted. The gate of the king. He's over all the wise men. Many great gifts. How many great gifts can the most powerful man in the known world give to someone that has just saved him from agitation and given him sleep back? When the Bible says many great gifts, they're different than our great gifts, right? My, my, uh, my kids will bring me a gift sometimes. right? They're different than if, if Bill Gates were to bring me a gift. Right? So this king, when he gave Daniel many great gifts, I bet it was just over the top. Over the top. But the only reason Daniel did this was because of his faith in God. The only reason he got this was, was because of his faith in God. Daniel did not set out to be rich and powerful. Daniel set out to believe in God. You see, often we want the blessing of God without the faith for God. Oh, I want to be in charge of everybody. I want all this. Daniel was just a man with some faith, belief in his God. You see, it's amazing what God can do with some simple faith. Over a hundred years ago, Helen Bolester, while still a teenager, was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in Saginaw, Michigan. By the age of 18, she was convinced that God wanted her to be a missionary to India, and she raised $75 a month support and purchased a ticket to sail to India. Missionaries raise a whole lot more than $75 a month now. Then her mother died. Her dad asked her to stay home and help him raise her eight siblings. She honored her father, returned her support, and canceled her ticket. When the next sibling was old enough to take care of the children, Helen married a man named Don Stafford. They had one child who was crippled. And shortly after that, her husband, Mr. Stafford, died. Later, she married a man named Emery Knowlton. Over the years, Henry, I'm sorry, Helen and Emery gave birth to three boys, all of whom also died. On May 14, 1929, she gave birth to twins, a boy she named William and a girl she called Winifred. William lived until July 25th, and he passed. Helen took her two-and-a-half-pound baby, Winifred, placed her little body in a satin-lined cigar box, put the cigar box on the altar of the Parr Memorial Baptist Church in Petoskey, Michigan. She prayed to God. She said, "'You took my four sons and my husband.'" I'd like to give you my daughter, and may there come from her those that would serve you. Talk about an impossible circumstance, right? You can't help but read that and hear that account, and your heart not go out to this lady who, who felt called to the mission field, and it seems like God just stopped her at every single point. Does that seem that way? But won't you know it when you have faith in God that God's always doing something? He's the God of the impossible solving. Winifred grew up to marry a young preacher by the name of Don, who for almost 60 years has pastored the Parker Memorial Baptist Church in Lansing, Michigan. Don's last name 
is Don Green. His grandson, Paul Green, is here at church. His, Paul's wife, Beth, sang the solo this morning before I preached this morning. According to the numbers I have, there are all today over 30 descendants of her descendants in the Lord's work. What can God do? He can take an impossible circumstance, shred it, turn it upside down, and do something great. What are you facing today? Impossible? Give it to God. Look impossible? Have faith. Pray with an urgency and a fervency, and God will demolish. He wants to demolish that impossible circumstance. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for being a God that we can have our faith in. Lord, I don't know what circumstances the people who are here are facing today. Lord, probably there are some who are facing something they seem to be impossible to them. Lord, help us to have the faith that you can bless. Lord, the faith that relies completely on you in a fervent prayer. I wonder this morning as you sit there with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if the Lord touched your heart. Maybe you're going through something very difficult right now, impossible. You'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? Right now, I, I want to have the faith in God that I need, and sometimes I feel like my faith is weak. Lord, touch my heart. Would you pray for me this morning? Slip your hand, slip back down. I'll see it. All right, amen. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. 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 Impossible to see all the hands, so many people. Can I encourage you, friend? Have faith in God. I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. If you were to die today, you're not sure that you'd go to heaven. But maybe also this morning, something inside your heart said, you know what? You talked about Christ and, and you've never done that. Can I pray for you as well? What if you'd say, Pastor, I I'm not sure I'm saved, but would you pray for me this morning when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll call no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. I see that hand. Thank you. I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, well, while I, I, uh, I'm not a perfect Christian, I have trusted Christ as my Savior, and as a testimony to, to my faith in Christ, I'll raise it now and say, well, I'm not a perfect Christian, I have trusted Christ, and I will proclaim that by slipping my hand up and say, I have trusted Christ. Would you slip your hand up for me? Amen. Folks all over who said, I've trusted Christ. I appreciate your honesty. There are those who did not raise their hand to, wanting to trust Christ and could not to say you have trusted Christ. Well, would you be honest one more time? Say, Pastor, I didn't raise my hand before about salvation, but I'll raise it now. I'm, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up, slip back down. We'll see it. Pray for you. Amen. See that. Who else? Lord, you've seen these hands, those who are going through a difficult circumstance, an impossible circumstance who have felt your touch this morning, uh, Lord, who need to respond in faith. I ask that you would help them to respond in the faith today and then tonight and tomorrow. Lord, may they see a great, great victory in that. Lord, those who have lifted their hands for salvation, may they respond with your grace today and maybe open a Bible and show them how to know for sure to go to heaven. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.